Welcome to Discover the Story with author Andrea Bashar. Andrea has penned over 40 novels and novellas as well as a number of articles and devotionals. She is a co-founder of the American Christian Fiction Writers and has served on its advisory board for many years. She is also the president and CEO of Steepleview Publishing. And now with today's story, here's your host, Andrea Bashar. Well, hello there. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today on Discover the Story. I am pleased as punch, as we say, to have Kathy Neely on my show today. Kathy's an author, and she hails from South Carolina. And my husband and I are going to be visiting there in October, so I'm really excited to meet Kathy. Hi, Kathy. How are you today? I'm fine, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you for having me as your guest. You are so welcome. I'm excited to have you as my guest. Um, Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, I am married and have three adult children and two delightful grandchildren. And you said I there from South Carolina. Actually, I'm originally from Pittsburgh and I oh. uh, lived there all my life. Yes, I lived there all my life until 14 years ago when we came to South Carolina and absolutely love it here. So I look forward to your visit. You know, it, it, it is kind of scary thinking about moving, isn't it? I mean, that, that was very brave of you. <laughs> Well, we wanted to make a southern move, and we looked at a number of places. And um, I, at the time, I had a sister living in Atlanta, and actually she is now um, Fountain Inn, which is right outside of where I live in Greenville. Um, so we, we managed to get together and managed to get my other Pittsburgh sister down here as well. That is so great because that's one of the places my husband and I are looking at is Fountain Inn. So does oh, she like okay. She does. She has horses, and so that's a little more rural, and okay. it suits her fine. Well, that's great. Well, now let's talk a little bit about, um, well, did, did you introduce yourself? I guess you did, didn't you? <laughs> well, I gave a brief introduction. Let me give a little bit more information. Um, sure. I was a teacher. Um, for a number of years, and then I went into administration and worked as a, as a um, elementary principal, first in Pittsburgh at a school called Eden Christian Academy, and then here in South Carolina at Shannon Forest Christian School. Um, a number of years ago, um, seven to be exact, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and when that occurred, for a number of reasons, I decided to retire. And I say for a number of reasons because I don't want to give the impression that people with Parkinson's can't be effective in the workplace because they certainly can. Um, But for me and uh, my situation, it was a little bit of a stress-filled job, and stress doesn't like Parkinson's. And um, the other other thing that, um, that occurred for me is that I frequently had to take the microphone. We had a lot of um, parent and visitor, um, different things going on. And when I took the microphone, I never loved the microphone, but I, but I did it. But then I would shake. (laughs) And I just, I just decided that it was, that it would be in my best interest for my health at that point to retire. Well, and I understand that too. Um, Is, is that when you took up writing or had you been writing before that? Well, I actually was a closet writer. <laughs> I was a wannabe writer, and I I did it. I didn't really tell anyone. It was just something that I loved to do, and I didn't really do it. Um, I, I didn't follow through and wasn't able to complete it because I was a full-time mom. I was a full-time teacher. Then I was a full-time principal, and that's a lot of full times. Oh, definitely. Um, yes, and um, so... When I retired, I pulled out an old manuscript that I had started many years ago, actually, when we were still in Pittsburgh. And a couple of things happened at the same time. One thing that happened was um, we have a, a ministry here in Greenville called Miracle Hill. And the keynote speaker at one of the fundraisers was a man called Mike Yankowitz, um, Yankowski. And he wrote a book called Under the Overpass. And when I heard him, 
it so closely mirrored the forgotten manuscript that I had started many years ago. He was a, a writer who went to live among the homeless for the purpose of writing, and so was my character, Scott Harrington, in a book called The Least of These. He was a um, journalist who wanted to write a documentary and went to live among the homeless. Well, that really motivated me to pull that back out and to get working on it. And then when I retired, I actually had the time to do that as well. And that um, manuscript, which is now a book, it just came out in May, right? That's correct. And that won an award, the Fresh Voice of 2015. That's correct. There were a few, um, I think it was the first five or ten pages that was sent into this um, contest that was, um, I guess it's still running um, on the website called Almost an Author, and it won first place in the fiction category. Well, that, it, that had to really motivate you, didn't it? It did. You know, it, it, it validates a little bit what you're doing. There's always a vulnerability in doing something so personal as writing and mm -hmm. you know, wondering if anybody really wants to read what you've written. So it, it really was a boost. I'm sure it was. And this actually, this story looks really interesting. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Sure. Um, Scott Harrington is a journalist, as I said, and he came from a family of um, high-powered high attorneys, and he chose not to go that route, uh, which was a great disappointment to his father. He also has um, a guilty secret that... Um, has to do with his brother's death many years before, and he carries this guilt around. Um, so when he goes to live among the homeless, he discovers their stories, which are the, of three men, which are all very different. And he realizes that he has the ability to impact their lives. And um, he has to make a decision if he's going to follow his goal to try to get the Pulitzer and his father's approval, or if he's going to um, step out of that role and help the men whose lives he has the ability to impact. Um, while that's going on, parallel to that is the story about Claire Bassett, who has two small children and a husband who disappeared a year before. All of her attempts to find any word about him had been fruitless. Um, his disappearance was following a traumatic incident. At one point, then, her story intersects Scott's story. And I'll leave it at that so you can read and find out what happens. Oh, definitely. That sounds like a wonderful book. I hope the listeners will want to buy it. Um, but this is not your first book because you had something come out in February. Um, and also, was it April too, correct? That's correct. Three in rapid succession. Wow, wow. So why don't you tell us about your um, the book before this? Um, it's called The Street Singer, right? That's correct. The Street Singer wasn't the first thing I wrote, but it was the first that reached publication. And The Street Singer is a story about um, Adam Marsh, whose um, name had been, her stage name had been Adeline. And she was quite famous in her time, which was around the same era that we would think of Ella Fitzgerald and um, that, uh, that time of life. Okay. Tr the main character is um, Trisha, and she's a law student. And Trisha was raised by her grandparents following her parents' death. And so she was familiar with the old vinyl records of Adeline, and her grandfather taught her to dance to them. Um, so she heard that Adeline was a street singer in Asheville, North Carolina, which was not far from where she lived. So she had to learn the truth. So she went down to that area. And sure enough, it was the same lady, of course, much aged and using the name Ada. So she befriended her and she wanted to know her story. What happened that she went from fame to at one point she had been a Grammy nominee to being a street singer. So she sees the boxes that Ada has in her storage closet, and the one says things to remember, and she convinces Ada to tell her story. So she meets with her each 
evening, um, well, a couple evenings a week, and they go through the items in the box one item at a time as Ada reveals the story of her abuse of childhood and her how she met up with the the uh, record people and began recording and to how they mistreated her because of her um, her illiteracy. Mm. So Trisha, who's a final in her final semester of law school, convinces her to seek retribution. And so they get the help of a pro bono attorney and they seek retribution. And then thrown into that whole mess is, of course, a little romance always adds some interest to your story, <laughs> um, is her, her um, engagement to Grant, who's a high-powered political family, um, versus uh, Rusty, who's the pro bono attorney um, that uh, has a soft and compassionate heart, and Tricia starts to rethink her in personal life. So um, that's the story. Now, are those two books connected? Is it a series, or are they all standalones? Uh, they're standalones. Okay. They're not connected. Okay. And then the book that came out in April, that was called Beauty for Ashes. That's correct, and it's also a standalone. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about that one? Sure. Um, let me give a little background about why I wrote that. Um, I read a book from an author that um, is one of my favorites, and that's um, Charles Martin. And he wrote, he wrote a book called Water from the Heart. And when I finished that book, it was so powerful. And I just, you know, it was the kind of book when you finish the last page, you just wanted to go on and you think about those characters for days. And at that point, I decided I wanted to write something thematically similar. So that gave birth to Beauty for Ashes. And the thematically similar meant that there was a main character who was really um, gripped by guilt over something that he had done many years ago. And he comes in contact then with the family that was impacted through his foolish actions. Mm. And um, in this case, um, he, he uh, meets the family of the man who died in an auto accident because of um, when he was a teenager. Oh. So he meets this family and um, he falls in love with not the daughter, but the niece of the man who was killed in the accident. She, of course, doesn't know that that was him. And um, the, he, it goes through the story of his panic attacks and his decision um, as he gets closer to the family. Is he going to withdraw? Is he going to remove himself from the only person that he ever loved? Is he going to confess um, what's going to happen? And um, the story takes a few twists and turns that I'm not sharing here because I'd rather you read it. No, oh, definitely. <laughs> you have been a busy, busy lady. Well, that sounds like a lot, but the truth is uh, that those stories were written over a period of um, three to four years. And they, okay. they just all got contracted at the same time. Well, that's really cool. I mean, th how did that change your life to suddenly be a published author and having three books out in a matter of months? Well, um, it's been exciting, but I, I don't really think I could say it's changed my life. Um, it's been something that I wanted to do and something that I'm thrilled that I was able to do. But my, my life is not me as an author. My life is me as a wife, me as a mother, me as a grandmother. Those are, those are the, the dreams of my life that have come true. Mm -hmm. I understand. Being a grandmother is just... Well, it is just such a privilege. I adore my grandchildren. So you have to tell our listeners now how many grandchildren you have. Well, I only have two. I shouldn't say only. They're the two most wonderful grandchildren in the world. And I know that every of grandmother course. thinks theirs is. Um, but <laughs> I have two. And unfortunately, they live nine hours away from me. So I cherish the moments that I get to spend with them. But aside oh, from definitely. the times I get to spend with them, my son and daughter-in-law are so gracious to FaceTime me every weekend where I get to talk with the boys and sometimes even read them a story um, through FaceTime. Uh, one other thing we've done is to have um, the same book 
they'll I'll, I'll I'll get from the library books that I know they have at home, and okay. then I can read and they can turn the pages. Oh, that is cool. And then you can kind of read to them? Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, on your blog, you say that um, you connected with a local group of Christian writers called Cross and Pens, and uh, they now it's become the word weavers. Can you just talk about how a local group of Christian writers uh, encouraged you or helped you to, you know, move forward in your goal to get published? Um, I sure will. Um, it's it's a great little group. Um, I I connected with them through Vonda Skelton, um, who's an author with some children's book published. And I, I first met her when she came into my school and spoke to the children. So when I retired and, you know, wanted to get back to the writing, I contacted her and she connected me with the group. Um, as I said, they're now word weavers. And from that group, then I formed a, um, I was invited to, form, to join a small critique group. And we met weekly um, to critique each other's work, which was um, unbelievably valuable oh yes and, yeah it real. it truly is and um i haven't been attending the um they're now word weavers and i haven't been attending because um with the parkinson's as it's progressed um i've started a, going to a group called rock steady boxing oh. and um it's yes i box i put on the gloves and i need a heavy bag three times a week <laughs> Um, oh, wow. But it's a great, wonderful group um, uh, program for people who, who suffer from Parkinson's. Um, it, it addresses so many specific Parkinson's skills from, of course, strength to balance to um, um, gait work to small motor dexterity. Um, we, we really cover everything in the hour and a half that we're together. And it also builds a sense of community. So I have to choose carefully where to spend my time. Um, but I do want to touch base from time to time with the group from Word Weavers just to keep that connection. Oh, sure. I, you know, I found that a local writing group just really just helps you get energized about your project and then to hear the different um, ideas floating around in the room you know it's just really a, a very like you said valuable connection because you have something in common and that is the love of the written word but if you're in and that's you know if you're in a secular group if you're in a Christian group then, of course, you have the love of the Lord and you can, you know, or the love for the Lord, I should say, and you can pray for each other. And that is so important. It is. And we always would open with a devotion and a prayer time. And um, that, you know, it just it marks you and sets you apart whenever you're able to meet with other Christians. Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, I think some people wonder, um, you know, how you even start? How, where do your ideas come from? Wow, that's a heavy question. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, um, the first one that I wrote, I, don't, I can't it really answer that question. I don't know where the idea came from that um, it just kind of percolated with the journalist and the homeless. Um, but like I said, with, this, with Beauty for Ashes, um, I sat down deliberately trying to think within that theme of something that would work. Um, and then for the street singer, um, I sat over lunch and brainstormed a little bit with a friend of mine. And um, we come up with uh, the general skeleton there of the plot. And then from there, I, I kind of defined it. Oh, that is terrific. When I was starting out, I was writing for a little book called book club called Heart Song Presents, but it used to be owned and operated by Barber Publishing, and I, I wrote a lot of books for that line, and then I had hooked up with four, well, three other ladies who were writing Heart Song Presents novels also, or maybe kind of dabbling outside that line and trying to write like a full-length novel. 
Um, but we critiqued each other's work, and I learned so much from these ladies. Just being able to get feedback on my work um, or just to brainstorm. You know, sometimes we'd call each other, and that was before we knew about emailing each other manuscripts. I mean, we actually would print out a chapter, fax it to each other. (laughs) We would critique it, and then we'd fax it back to them, you know. So (laughs) Back in the old days. (laughs) Back in the old days before the Internet was really the internet i guess we had AOL of course <laughs> but mm-hmm. um and i and i know a lot of people still have AOL and that's fine my husband loves his AOL account at the time that was almost the only email other than i think yahoo had some email accounts too uh so it was it was an interesting time going from the typewriter to the computer i don't know if you found that if you were writing on the typewriter or not well, I was writing on a typewriter um, 20 years ago whenever um, the least of these was, was first thought of. Um, but for, when I, from the time that I became serious about writing when I retired, of course, then I was computer. Um, the other thing that, was, that I did for a while, um, I'm a member of ACFW, and mm-hmm. um, for a while I did their, their um, critique group or critique loop, they call it, online. Okay. And for listeners who might not know the acronym ACFW, it stands for American Christian Fiction Writers. And I am a co-founder of that organization, so I will tell I, I will say that right up front. It is a fantastic organization. And if you're a Christian fiction author, you need to join this group because you will find they have little genres all hooked up. You can you can be in the mystery and writing genre or mystery and suspense genre. You can be in the romantic suspense genre. You can pick, you know, the literary, more, you know, literary kind of work. Um, and you just get a lot of help with uh, your writing, as Kathy said, or um, just brainstorming. You can meet other authors on there. On the loop, they have like a big, you know, face. I think is everything on Facebook now, or do they? No, they have um, a loop, right? Well, I'm on two of their Facebook loops, but um, they have other loops that you can choose to join, and then that's done through email. And that that was the critique group that I had joined. There, it's a great organization, and they also have um, the the Fiction Finder, which I was able to list my books in Fiction Finder. And for those who don't, aren't familiar with that, you can go in and search for books by title, by author, by genre, by topic. Um, and it, for, for authors who are looking for similar books, um, for instance, the one that I'm actually working on now has to do with um, adoption. And I went in to look by topic to see if there were other books that I could read that would touch on the same subject. Sure, and and that's an excellent way. Also, um, readers can go on Fiction Finder, and they can find interesting things to read. So that is a really a great promotional tool for a lot of writers. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Well, I can't believe it, Kathy, but we are running out of time. Is there a final message you want to leave with our uh, listeners. We kind of talked about a lot of things. We talked about your books. We talked about your Parkinson's and and the great program that you discovered, boxing. I think that is so great. <laughs> and we talked about <laughs> we talked about you know local and national writers organizations. And maybe you just want to kind of bring it all together. Well, let me make mention that if you're looking for my books. Um, I'm Kathleen as a writer. Um, I go by Kathy or Kathleen, either one. But if you're looking for my books, it's under Kathleen Neely. And you can find, uh, well, I imagine you'll have my website listed. But for those who are looking for it, it's just www.kathleenneely.com. That's pretty simple. Um, but no, I've, uh, it's been delightful talking with you. And 
uh, so many things that we share, the, you know, ACFW background and the critique groups and um, your desire to come to Greenville. I look forward to that. Oh, and I am looking forward to it too, Kathy. Thank you for being on Discover the Story today. And you know, listeners, as I re-listened to this episode, the theme that kept popping out at me was the seasons of life. You know, Kathy talked about the many seasons in her life. She moved, she made a big move from Pennsylvania to South Carolina. She changed positions from teacher to principal. She was raising children. She learned she had Parkinson's disease. Um, Then she retired from her career. She became a published author. And she talked about being a grandma. Those are a lot of big life changes, aren't they? And you may be thinking as you listen that you've had a lot of life changes too. I know my husband and I certainly have in the past 10 years. So we can look at some of those as being depressing. They give us anxiety when we think about them. But actually, those dark seasons or just seasons of life make life exciting. But why do... You know, we have to go through the dark seasons. Sometimes I just don't understand. And sometimes I feel like it's not fair. Sometimes it feels like everyone else in the world is so happy and perfect and their life is wonderful. And then I'm going through this junk, you know, here at my in my life. Well, I found these verses that really helped me. First Peter 5.10 in the Holy Bible says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Jesus Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And then James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So if you think about the last episode with Linda Evans Shepherd, she took a Bible verse and she prayed it. And she knows full well that she's praying the will of God because she's praying scripture. And that's what we have to do. We have to pray scripture when life gets into those dark seasons. And we just feel so lost and alone. But we're not alone. So I hope that you will take a look at Kathy's website. It's Kathleen, with a K, Neely, N-E-E-L-Y dot com. And also, listeners, you are going to be able to find pictures. And um, I'll post links on my Facebook page today. Just log into Facebook and search for Discover the Story. You can also find out about my books and me by visiting my website at andreabeshar.com. Meanwhile, join me each week as we discover the story with a variety of special guests here on the Christian Women Affiliate Radio Network. See you next time. You've been listening to Discover the Story with author Andrea Bashar. We hope that you've enjoyed today's program. Join us next time and discover the story.